Genesis 25. We're going to wing it tonight. No notes. How's that? Because <clears throat> really all I need to do is just read the Bible to you. And we'll be just fine. Actually, Genesis 26. Um, <clears throat> you know, before we get to 26, you know, we never did finish out 25. Let me... Let's do that. Um, this is the first part, because it's actually in two parts, of Jacob receiving birthright. And this is actually critical to our doctrine, to, and because it shows God's plan. It, it shows his way. Um, generally... It, and this is, I guess, a universal thing that the firstborn, especially the male child, um, although in English or British heraldry, in the monarchy, it doesn't, the firstborn doesn't have to be a male. In the monarchy in England, it's the firstborn child, period. They're either going to be the queen or the king, one of the two. And I often wondered what happens if it just so happens that in the future, Britain's monarch is a transgender. What kind of title do you come... You, you're go, I mean, you're talking about rituals and rites that go back a thousand years and beyond to, you know, all of these titles that they put on a king or a queen. And what are they going to do if it's transgendered? What do you call it? The thing? I don't know. Uh, but anyway, generally, the majority of an inheritance would go to the firstborn child. And so we know the story that um, the two children are wrestling inside of, of Rachel's, um, not Rachel, um, who am I talking about here? Rebecca, inside of her womb. And God has already chosen the one that the bloodline of Christ is going to come through. He's already picked that. And we saw the typology last Sunday of the man of promise versus the man of sin. And, and Esau, because his color is red, and because he's furry and hairy and everything like that, he's a dog or a beast of some kind. So he's, he represents the man of sin, and God is not going to choose his bloodline through the man of sin. It's not going to happen. So let's pick it up in Genesis 25, verse 24. Um, when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was three score years old when she bare them. He's 60 years old. The boys grew. And Esau was a cunning hunter. That reminds, that puts me in the mind of Nimrod. Nimrod being the first king on the earth. I think Nimrod is a type of the Antichrist, the man of sin. Certainly... Um, he is a mighty hunter before the Lord. And that phrase, before the Lord, it can mean one of two things or both of them. Number one, what he does is always in the sight of God. God sees everything that he does. Number two, his hunting skills, in his mind, he believes that he is better than even God at hunting down animals and such. So he sees himself 
as being before the Lord. What's the commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods where? Before me. And so if you kind of look at it from that perspective, kind of makes you, maybe gives you the idea, the same idea that we know the beast, the Antichrist has in Ezekiel 28, 2 Thessalonians 2, he thinks he is God. He wants everybody else to believe he's God. He is the counterfeit God. He is the counterfeit Savior. Um, I'll bring this back up again simply because it fits. Uh, men like Dr. Stephen Greer and others who are in contact with these quote-unquote aliens and to me it's it's funny dr stephen greer this scientist medical professional when he wants to contact what he believes are the alien civilizations they did not give him the schematics for building a new type of radio that he can pick up the microphone and call to the aliens to come visit him. In order to contact them, he goes into a 3,000-year-old Hindu religious practice called uh, Medi... What, what is the type that he does? I know he practices Merkaba mysticism, but he basically goes in to a trance and does a Hindu chant. And when his mind gets into this altered state of consciousness, that's when he can communicate with what he thinks are the aliens. What does that tell you? That they are familiar spirits. They're devils. They're the gods that you see in the Bible. And what's going to happen is the ultimate form of um, devil possession. They're going to inhabit not just one person, they're going to inhabit everybody. And they will be under their control. Uh, so anyway, um, when her days, let's see, verse 25, verse 25, we have Esau. They called his name Esau, come out with a hairy garment. Number 20, verse 26, and after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was three square years old when she bare them. The boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. We would call him Mama's boy. That's how the, he would be referred. But he was just a plain man, and he liked being in the tents with Mom. He probably learned how to cook and do other things and so on. I, uh, verse 28, And Isaac loved Esau. Because he did eat of his venison. He was a very good hunter, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So now in verse 29, Jacob sod pottage. Think, and what is pottage? It's, and practically every civilization, every culture has a form of this. It's whatever you throw in the pot and cook it. Okay? Um, whether it's stew, do what? Chicken slop, Chicken slop yeah. We had a, de a deacon here years ago that made what he called slum gullion. I don't know where that word come from, but have you heard that before? It, but it was, you know, you grow up poor, and so whatever you throw in the pot, whatever you've got left, you throw it in the pot and you cook it and see how it turns out. Um, but just about every culture has some version of that, um, whether it's a, a curry of some kind or it's a stew of some kind or chili or whatever, just whatever you throw in there. Uh, and that's what it is. He's sod pottage. So he's got a he's got a big bowl of stew over the fire. Esau came from the field and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee. With that same red, isn't that interesting, the color of it? 
It's a curry, I'm telling you. It's got to be a curry. Or it's a uh, Kenya stew made with Royco. Okay? Uh, if you've never had Royco, it's a, it's a seasoning mix, and it is delicious. And I don't know if Mama Michael's ever had my uh, Royco chicken, but I make a fantastic dish. I woke up one morning and went, oh, that would be good. And you can only, it's a, you can only get it in Kenya. But it's, it's different, but it's really good. Uh, but the same red pottage. Think about the, the color red here. It's symbolic of his sin. And the flesh. And I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, Esau, verse 30. Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee. That's that same red pottage. For I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. Remember what the word Adam means. It means red like the clay. And Esau was red like the clay. And his hair was reddish. And he just is this beast character. And he wants to be fed. He's, he's, he's acting with a beast nature. Think about it. He is hungry. And he refuses to choose to wait on the food that he's going to get. And you look at this story because it says a lot of his character. Uh, I am faint, therefore was this name called Edom. Jacob said, sell me this day thy birthright. And if, if I would have been Esau, I would have said, nuts to you. Um, that's what was written on the response, if you know your history, at the Battle of the Bulge. Um, the Germans practically had the Allied forces, the Americans mainly, surrounded in the forest. It was the dead of winter. It was right at Christmas time. And the Germans basically were giving the Americans the chance to surrender. So they, so they typed up a, um, a letter to the whoever was in command of the American forces at the time sent somebody out under a white flag with that letter and it was the Germans basically saying if you surrender we will treat you well you know we won't come in killing everybody but it's Christmas so why don't you surrender and so whoever was in command of the American forces took the piece of paper took the pen and wrote the word nuts on it and sent it back to the Germans. And they looked at that for hours going, bust these nuts. They didn't, know what, they didn't know what that meant. Is he saying yes? Is he saying no? Well, we get it. Nuts. We ain't doing it. So anyway, I would have said, forget it. I'll wait. I'm not selling you my birthright. And I want you to think about this. His birthright was what he would inherit from his father. And remember, everything that Abraham had, he gave it to who? Isaac. Now everything that Isaac has goes to Esau just because he was the firstborn. So he inherits everything. And then, that inheritance is everlasting. Esau's firstborn then would have been the recipient of all of that inheritance. And that inheritance probably grows over time. Cattle, you know, bringing in more cattle and them taking over more land and getting more servants. That, just, that thing's just going to grow. But what does Esau do? This is what he says. Verse 32, and Esau said, Behold, I'm at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? Now, ask yourself the question, is he really going to die? No. But he represents those who follow after the lust of the flesh. That's who he represents. 
and whatever his flesh demands, Esau gives in to it. He's not really going to die. If he would have waited, he could have found something somewhere to eat. He could have strangled, a, uh, he could have found a, he could have found that possum I run over last night. And things are not very fast, Chris. On the way, we, uh, on the way out to um, Matthew and Pages, the stupid thing wouldn't get out of the road. And I was in a hurry, so anyway, poor possum. Esau could go out and get his own food, but he is so, this is, this is most lost people. This is why most people will never, ever be saved. It is because they are so used to giving in to the demands of their flesh. So let's talk about that for a minute. We have more now in this world than actually that they had then. They didn't have much in the way of drugs in Esau's day. Mind-altering drugs, drugs that give you feelings of euphoria, things like that, intoxicants. Um, they had wine, they had strong drink. But people who, most people who are on drugs or who drink, or I personally know somebody who has given themselves over, and this is a man, he has given himself over to giving out his body on these apps on your phone to other men. He has so gotten into this that it's, I, I don't know this for sure, but I'm reasonably certain that it's almost a daily thing. Almost every day, some new fling to have. He would rather sell what he could have in eternity for just a temporary fix of the flesh. Those who are on drugs, same thing. We haven't seen Bobby in a while. Worries me a little bit. We don't know where he is. Bobby is the man that we found nearly dead out here. And we tried to save his life. He would come by every now and then. Every now and then we'd give him a room for a night because he had no other place to stay. His parents kicked him out because of his drug habit. We witnessed to him many times, prayed over him many times. We've done everything that we possibly could for the guy. Haven't seen him in a while, but he is someone who literally cannot stop his drug habit. He can't stop. He wants that fix. He wants that high. And he will do whatever it takes in order to get that. And we've tried to tell him the gospel. You know, Christ can fix that. You know, I'm not saying that he will, but I've met people. I used to know a guy out at Richwoods that he started, him and his family started coming to church. And I mean, he, he was a heavy drinker. And he prayed to God that God would take that away from him. And he said one day he woke up and he first thing he usually did was go get him a drink. And he said he drank and he barfed. And he said, I kept trying it all day long, trying to drink. And he said, it just come right back out of me. And he said, finally, my mind said, quit. And he said, I didn't want it after that. So I know God can do that with people. It doesn't do it with everybody, but he did it with him. Okay. So. 
Anything's possible. But most people, most people who are offered the help don't want it. Don't want it. They'd rather keep getting high and I think, Alicia, I think I agree with you. A lot of these guys, they know when they buy that heroin, they know it's loaded with fentanyl. And fentanyl's deadly. It, it, yeah, and that's, they want that. And I think nine times out of ten, I think most of them want to die high. Because they're tired of waking up every day wanting a fix and going hours without being able to get it or maybe days without being able to get it and they finally get it and they push in too much and some of them actually want to die while they're high the police have narcan they shoot them with narcan and what that does is it blocks all of the opiates and the effects of it so if they're as high as a kite as soon as that narcan hits they're down to back to where they were, but at that point, they're still wanting a fix, and they're sick over it. They're physically, physically sick over it, and they don't want that. So you have a lot of, we have a lot of Esau's in this world. Thank God that God brought each one of us to a place where he said, you're not going to be Esau. And we decided that we would rather live this life the way God wants us to do. What does the Bible say about Moses? Rejected the pleasures of sin for a season. Because Moses could have been with Moses. the Red Sea because Moses being chased God's people across the Red Sea. Moses chose to live for God rather than the pleasures of sin for a season. And boy, that I was right. It's a pleasure for a while, then it's gone. And so this is there's a lot of say there's a lot of Esau's in this world. Who, uh, when offered salvation, offered help, offered a way out, they won't take it. They say to themselves, well, I'm not done. I'm not done living this. I'm not done getting high. I'm not done pleasing my flesh. I'm not done chasing men, chasing women. I'm not done with that yet. And unfortunately, it may be that they never get done until they die. There was a name in our family that we didn't mention this morning that death has taken him out of our family it was an uncle of mine it was my mom's brother he's the brother that you don't talk about and at one time he, he would marry a woman just to be with her and at one time he had we think maybe three wives at one time in different states yeah. We actually got to meet one of his daughters that we never knew at my grandma's funeral. She's a real nice lady, a Christian lady. But um, this particular uncle died of cirrhosis of the liver in his 30s. And I mean, he did everything. And I mean, he did everything was almost no good from birth but that's what he chose he chose to be Esau knowing that there was a better way a better life and he refused to have it and so that's Esau that's Edom that's red verse 31 Jacob said sell me this day thy birthright Esau said behold I'm at the point to die and what profit shall this birthright do to me and Jacob said swear to me this day and he swear unto him and he sold his birthright unto Jacob then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils John you keep saying my microphone's going on and off I don't know 
Ha? I don't know. Um, Jake, verse 34, Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. And just put that in the context of heaven and salvation. Esau despised eternal life. Esau despised God's love. Esau despised God. Esau despised the new heaven and the new earth. Esau despised God's love for him. Esau despised the cross upon which Jesus died to pay for Esau's sins. And you have a lot of that around the world right now. Uh, I used to have this on a cassette tape years ago. I used to do sermons and give examples of rock and roll and some of the stuff that's in it. Now you can't do that because rock and roll's gotten so vulgar and pop music has gotten so vulgar. You just can't, you can't play the examples. But um, there was a, um, a quote, ACDC was coming to St. Louis and they were on KC95, they were being interviewed. Um, who was it that, that, was, that was given the interview? Angus, it was Angus Young. Angus and Malcolm Young were the two guys on ACDC. And Angus Young, um, they said, uh, they were introducing the song that they were going to play on the radio. And he said, here's a song uh, describing how we describe our tours. It's called Highway to Hell. And he said, you know, when you think about it, it's pretty boring in heaven. Well, that's, he's Esau. And who was it? Bon Scott was their original lead singer. That they sang, uh, they sang a concert somewhere. Uh, and, you know, you party and get drunk before you ever even get out of the stadium. And they partied and got wasted and drunk and everything else. And the limo takes them somewhere to hotel, I guess, or something like that. He's passed out in the back. So they just said, throw a coat over him. We'll, we'll get him in. We'll let him sleep it off, get him in the morning. I ain't dragging him upstairs. And he choked on his vomit while he was passed out and died that night. And where is he right now? He is screaming that he's sorry. But does, does it work that way? No. Don't sell your birthright. Don't trade what is eternal for something that's temporary. And I don't care if God makes you a billionaire for life, that's temporary. That's why most rich people will not be Christians. And the truth of it is, if a billionaire started coming to this church, I would probably be very uncomfortable with that because most people with money like to control where their money goes and how it's used. I've had that happen before. And I've prayed about that. As soon as I started putting stuff on the internet, I prayed, God, don't ever give us somebody who's got a lot of money who wants to control us. Don't do that. I'd rather pray for every penny that comes in that we need as to have to have somebody with money try to tell us what we should do as a church, what we can and cannot do. That's what I'd rather have. But that's what he did. He traded in what was eternal for what was temporary. Now verse 26. And we're going to read through a lot of this because it's very, very similar. Like father, like son here. There was a famine in the land, chapter 26, beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. The Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. 
Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee, for unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. So God is God has given this the same promise to Abraham. Now he is signifying to Isaac, the oath belongs to you. The promise that I made to your father, it officially now abides with you. It's not to Ishmael. It doesn't belong to him. This oath, this promise, this covenant belongs to you. As I said to Abraham, out of thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That's what I'm saying to you. Out of thee shall all the families of the earth be, be blessed. And that's what happened. Because then uh, Isaac gives, gives birth uh, to Jacob. Jacob then gives birth to Judah. Judah then through the tribe of Judah comes Jesus Christ. Verse 4, and I will make thy seed to multiply as the what? Stars of heaven. Now I like this. I like this. Because I do believe that every star in the sky is an angel. I know that that doesn't, you know, uh, the universities of America don't ever ask me to write textbooks for them. Okay? But I don't care. I know what my Bible says. I believe what my Bible says. And I believe that every dot up in that sky is an angel. And I think God's got a name for everyone. And by the way, this new... Uh, space telescope we have. This thing is, if, I, if you thought Hubble was awesome, this thing's going to churn out stuff that man is going to go like that. I think we're going to see things for the first time that we don't even know, we probably don't even have a name for them yet. I think we're going to see things. We're already seeing way farther than the Hubble telescope ever saw. And to me, that just, that blows my mind. I love stuff like this. Talk about it all night. But every one of those stars represents an angel. And what he's saying here, literally, that's why there's 12 tribes. That's why there's 12 months. That's why there's 12 groups or constellations of stars, one for each month. That's why Jerusalem has 12 gates and 12 foundations and 12s all over it. And the, the woman in Revelation 12 has a crown of 12 stars, okay? That's because Jesus said in the resurrection, we shall be as the angels of heaven. And when you think about the, the 12 tribes, when God had them stop and set up their tents, they always did it in a particular fashion. Judah was always to the east. And they went around like this, and, and Dan was always to the north. They always had their place centered around the tabernacle. And Psalm 19 says that the heavens are a tabernacle for the sun. Well, the sun is Christ, who is the high priest, who when he goes into the tabernacle, he goes from east to west, just like the sun does in the heavens. I mean, God framed all of that and did it on purpose. Exactly. That's why he said, do it this way. Don't do it another way. Do it exactly this way, because it was to be a model of the universe seen from our perspective. I love this stuff. I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven. And by the way, oh, I wish I could show you a picture. There's still stars being made right now. One of the things we did see with Hubble is this cloud formation, and it is huge. And you can see at various places in this big space cloud formation, it looks like it's generating stars as we speak. It's like little cherries you pick out of a tree. They're still being, they're still being multiplied. I will multiply thee as the stars of heaven. And will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And he's referring to Jesus. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice, obviously he did, Isaac, or you wouldn't be alive. <laughs> my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Verse 6, and Isaac dwelt in Gerar, 
And the men of the place asked him of his wife, like father, like son. And he said, she is my sister. That's the same thing Abraham. Now, technically, they were. They were some of the, from the same family line. She is my sister, for he feared to say, she is my wife. Lest, said he, the men of the place should kill me for Rebekah, because she was fair to look upon. And it came to pass when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out a window and saw, and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah, his wife. You think they were playing football? No. He was kissing on her and she was giggling, sporting with his wife, 60 year old man. And Abimelech called Isaac and said, uh, behold of a surety, she is thy wife. And how saidst thou, she is my sister. And Isaac said unto him, because I said, lest I die for her. And Abimelech said, and if you think about it, Isaac is Christ. Rebecca is the church. And are we not his sons and his daughters? So, yes, we are, because of our new birth, the sister of Jesus Christ. So both statements are true, but we also are his bride. Bimelech said, verse 10, what is this thou hast done unto us? One of the... People might have lightly have lying with thy wife, and thou shouldest have brought guiltiness upon us. And Abimelech charged all of his people, saying, He that toucheth this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year an hundredfold. If you write, make a little note in your Bible, right next to verse 12, a hundredfold is exactly how much uh, you could get in return for sowing the good seed on good soil. The parable in Mark or in Matthew 13, Mark chapter 4, the parable says some 30, some 60, some an hundredfold is the same number. The number 100 is based upon the number 10. It's 10 times 10. That number is the number of dominion and authority, represents the Ten Commandments, but the Ten Commandments then are boiled down to two commandments, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And that's what a good, that's, that's what makes a good church, whether it's 30, 60, or 100, is that the people love the Lord their God and they love one another. Amen? And I, you know, I know churches, there's some churches bigger and that's fine. But when you've got 15,000 people in your church, you can't say that everybody here loves everybody else. Because you're talking about what? Three acres between this pew and that pew over there. You just can't love people that way. Uh, very quickly, verse 13, and the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. See the possessions growing. The inheritance is growing. Look, and Esau sees this. Look what I gave up. For he had possession of flocks and possession of herds and great store of servants. And the Philistines envied him. Here we see in the Philistines really for the first time. And the Philistines always are the enemies. Think of the Philistines as devils. Principalities and powers rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. That's how you think of the Philistines. They are always out to destroy God's promised people. And verse 15, we'll, we'll get into next Sunday night. For all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham his father, the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth. And Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we. See, even... Even Abimelech was afraid of him. He was afraid of him. Because Isaac and all of his servants and all of his cattle, he was actually wealthier than the king 
of the Philistines. The king of the Philistines is going, ah, we can't have that. You need to go from us. And he does. But we'll look into this next Sunday night. We'll look into this filling up the wells. What do you think that well represents? Or those wells that Abraham dug? What do you think they represent? The word of God. The water. The well spring. The day spring from on high. It represents salvation. And what are the Philistines doing every single day? They're stopping up the wells. This, this is really why they don't want Christianity in schools. They don't want Christianity anywhere else. It's not that they don't want religion. They just don't want ours in their schools. They don't want children becoming children of God. Because they have plans for that generation. And they're not good. Uh, we'll close. I unfortunately, I don't remember. Somebody sent me this video. And it was a male kindergarten teacher. Who had a beard. A dress and a lisp. And this is back when the, everybody was wearing masks at school. And so he makes a video without his mask. You see, he's got a full beard, and he's wearing this flowery women's dress, talking with this lisp and saying that one day during class, he took his, pulled his mask down, and one of his students went, you're a man? And he was going, oh, it was such an emotional time. Even my kindergarten students respected me. And I'm going, uh, I don't think you're telling it right. I think that kid was going, something ain't right about that people there is no way on earth that I would put my child into a sodomite dress wearing man's kindergarten class I would not do it let's stand to our feet the Book of Mormon's holding up pretty good. Uh, Reagan's off the ventilator. Praise the Lord. And her first words are, I have to go potty. So amen. Appreciate everybody's prayers. Father, thank you for being good to us. Thank you for being good to my granddaughter, being good to my son and my daughter-in-law. Thank you for being good to my family, being good to these people, Lord. We love you. We ask for your grace and your mercy and your blessings, Father. Lord, this world, there's people in this world absolutely sick. Absolutely sick. And, Lord, it sickens me to think about it. Lord, I thank you, God, the opportunity you gave me years ago to lead a very, very lost young man to you. And, Lord, give that chance to me again, and I'll do it again. But some people just go beyond sin they become beasts and they have absolutely no control over their nature and your word says that they are natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed and Lord we know that you will one of these days father we ask God that you just give us the grace 
to live in the times that you have chosen for us to live in. I'm sure that every generation has looked at their world and seen absolute wickedness, but Lord, it's terrible out there now. So God, have mercy on us. Go with us, protect us, and keep us. Uh, Lord, ever be with us, God, and, and give us a desire to both study your word, read your word, think about your word, but also fulfill your word and do what your word says. Bless us tonight. We thank you, God, for your blessings, and we pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.